Well, kia ora. Good morning. Thanks for everybody coming to the first session, third day of Crazy and Ambitious. Um, we won't go through a whole lot. We've got a plenty of speaker to start, Josh Veers. He comes from California. There's a biography in here. I won't kind of go through it, but it, it describes his sort of watershed scale approach to research and social ecological systems. And it's a little bit about ecological surprises. And uh, I think that it actually sets it up really nicely for the rest of the day in terms of an ecosystem stream and a threatened species stream. Um, so the talk today, to start with the Black Swan Brown River, how a flea free-flowing river transform California's approach to river management. So without further ado, I'll turn you over to Josh. Thanks. Kia ora. Good morning. I apologize in advance that uh, my te reo is uh, not very well developed. Uh, it consists mostly of trying to imitate the All Blacks haka. Kamate, uh, kamate, gyora, gyora. And I think it ends with witi te ra. Um, very inspiring, um, and it's very good to be here. Thank you, Melanie and, and Andrea, for inviting me. Um, I'd like to, to share some of what we've been up, in, up to in, in California, in part, um, because I think there's some crossover, some, some lessons learned, perhaps. Uh, I think one of the uh, talking points yesterday was not always having to be the leader. Sometimes you can uh, follow in other people's footsteps and let them make the missteps and, and learn from that. Um, so in, in some ways, I think you'll, you'll hear a bit more of it. Um, in the end, it's a, it's a bit of a, a story of, of swans, ducks, and fishes, oh my. Um, so we'll cycle through that. But if there are two things to remember by the end of this talk, um, flows are fundamental and connectivity is critical. And I'll come back to both of those points. Um, so our crazy and ambitious idea was that academics from the University of California could actually work together. So we have a number of different campuses and we tend to be pretty competitive. Um, and so our UC Water Security and Sustainability Research Initiative was funded by our Office of the President with the, the simple idea that we should bring the best that the University of California has to offer together to solve California water problems. Uh, but before I begin, I should tell you a little bit about where I'm from. Uh, this may look a bit like New Zealand, <laughs> um, certainly you know, plenty of head of uh, dairy cows. Uh, but this is the University of California Merced campus, and you may not have heard of us. We're the 10th and newest campus of the University of California system. Um, we opened our doors in 2005. Uh, we're at 6,000 students and, and skyrocketing towards near 10,000 students by 2020. Uh, we're hiring 150 new faculty in the next three years. And we're positioned in the San Joaquin Valley, which is one of the most underrepresented places in higher education within the state. Um, so, as it turns out, three out of four of all of our students are first-generation college goers. Two out of three re receive federal aid. 45% of the students are of Hispanic origin. 30% are Asian Americans. Our African American enrollments are uh, twice the other campuses percentage-wise. We are the face of California. It's very diverse, and in this case, this location is also very poor. Um, it's an experiment in higher education, and, and that is, can we make a difference in a, in a regional economy, um, and a regional presence, and a regional identity? And I believe we can. So Merced's a bit like Wellington. It's smack dab in the middle of the state. Um, and if you think a little bit more about where is Merced, when our, our uh, gateway to Yosemite is what we, we say, that means that we're not really anywhere, uh, just north of Fresno and um, outside of the city centers of uh, San Francisco at the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. Um, it's important to kind of contextualize the spatial dimensions of California, um, not quite as latitudinally broad as New Zealand, but certainly kind of the coastline stretches a good, good portion of that. Um, it, in some ways, we are a bit like an island, at least politically. Uh, they call us the left coast for a reason. Uh, there are 40 million people in the state of California. Um, it, sometimes we're as much as the, the sixth most productive economy in the world, and other times the tenth, just depending on you how, how you count those things. Um, but suffice it to say, it's a, 
uh, a bit of a nation state um, and a difficult one to manage at times. When you think of California water, this is probably the image that comes to mind. Uh, not just the palm trees, but uh, millions of consumers in a, in a common pool resource with conduits delivering a resource to those that you know, have high demand. Um, that isn't totally untrue, um, especially when the water runs out and the pool goes dry. Um, so we just came out of what is either the most severe five-year drought in history, in recent recorded history, or perhaps a 10-year drought with a single little blip in 2011 uh, where we had sufficient rainfall. It really stressed our systems in, in, in many and new ways and, and asked us to look very critically at water resources um, in, in new dimensions. And, and certainly there were some changes in behavior and some changes in policy that came through with that. Um, some of those I'll, I'll touch on here in a second. But it's important to realize that the drought that happens in California isn't something that happens on decadal basis. It certainly does with El Nino, the Southern Oscillation, the uh, Pacific de Decadal Oscillation, and so forth. Uh, but drought happens every summer. Uh, so we have a Mediterranean montane climate, uh, which is cool, wet winters, dry, warm summers. And we have a distribution of water resources across the strait that are very striking. In, in the far northwest corner of the state, we get over four meters of precipitation. In the desert portions, we get four centimeters of precipitation. Um, so you put 40 million people on that landscape. 60% of all the supply is north of our capital in Sacramento. 60% of all the demand is south of there. So the areas in blue represent 90% of all the land area, or 90% of all the runoff and only 40% of the land area. The areas in orange and red are just 1% of all that runoff, and yet they make up an equal share of that land area. So how do we make it all work? With one of the most extravagantly designed, engineered systems in the world that took nearly five decades to build out, we have over 12,000 dams, um, many of those major, major dams, um, on almost every river in the state. We move that water from north to south over 1,000 kilometers. To put that in context, that's like the Milford Track, put a big reservoir, put in a giant pipe, and send it to 20 million people in Auckland. And that's what we do in California when we send water to Los Angeles and San Diego. That comes with some cost. And I'll get to that in a second, but it's also important to recognize that that water, 80% of all of that developed water is for agriculture. So we're almost entirely an irrigated agriculture scheme, and most of it's delivered in small ditches like this. So that network of aqueducts and diversions and so forth, there's the gray infrastructure, but there's also a lot of brown infrastructure, much like this. Um, and that supports a very vibrant agricultural economy. Um, we're supplying you know, half of the United States with fruits, nuts, and vegetables. Um, we're the fifth largest supplier of food. Um, you'll recognize that many of these commodities, milk and cream, almonds, grapes, these are certainly ones that you might find in, in New Zealand, but in our case, they're also very water hungry and require developed water, either from groundwater or surface water, in order to provide those. So as we lurch into a world with uh, seven billion people, many of them hungry, food security and water security are now going hand in hand. It has come with some cost, however. Um, throughout the state, as we built these large dams, we cut off the, the migratory pathway for a lot of our anadromous salmon. Um, and other native fishes also became imperiled. So we have about 129 different species of native fishes in the state. Many of these are endemic. Uh, these are mostly at the, the genera level. We have very few species, as it turns out, uh, but, but very many genera. So over the last 30 years, the number of reasonably secure species has been reduced by half, and the number of listed species, either threatened or endangered with extinction, have increased sixfold. These are the bellwethers of our aquatic ecosystems. It's not surprising that many of these sensitive taxa are below the dams and highly concentrated in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valley that you see there in the center, as well as up in the North Coast. Many of those, in fact, are our anadromous salmon. 
it's not just blocking those migratory pathways uh, that creates problems for these fishes, but also the alteration in flow. So the natural flow regime, which we refer to as the magnitude, the timing, the frequency, the rate of change, the pulse of the planet, if you will, has been altered greatly. Sometimes that's for hydropower development, other times it's for diversions to agriculture and urban demands. But suffice it to say, our flows are very much out of sync with the natural history requirements of many of our species, most notably our anadromous salmon. So we're at the southern limit of several species of salmon distribution. So anadromous means sea run. They spend a good portion of their life out at sea. They come back to reproduce. It's a very virtuous cycle. It's very iconic, the peoples of the, the Northwest as well as Alaska, across the Pacific Rim into Kamchatka of Russia, have strongly identified with the species, um, in part because it provides sustenance. It's protein, it's nutrients. And it used to come back by the millions. In California now, many of these streams are down to a few individuals. And the most iconic of these, the king or Chinook salmon, is highly imperiled. So of the four different runs, we have a fall run, a winter run, a late winter run, and a spring run. Three of those are in imminent danger of extinction. One of those, the fall run Chinook, in fact, is propped up entirely by hatcheries. Those of you who are into the taxonomy will recognize the adipose fin there, and it's missing here. So they clip these fins in the hatcheries so that we're able to tell the difference. So this is a wild-born salmon. It's one of the few left. How we manage our water to have both salmon and agriculture is a central challenge for us. And nowhere is that more apparent than the Sacramento and San Joaquin drainage, where 48% of all of California drains out. So again, if you think about that 1,000 kilometers from the South Island to the North Island, all of that draining out to a central location. It's one giant watershed. And at the base of that is what we refer to as a delta. And for those of you who study rivers might recognize that usually deltas go out. In this case, it's an inverted delta. It's a bit of a triangle. And that choke point is where the San Andreas Fault cuts across the North Pacific Plate. There's a bit of an occlusion. That water backs up and historically, it, when during the Holocene, the glaciers were present. It wasn't apparent. It was after the sea level rise and so forth. But I draw your attention to the lower left-hand corner, which was 150 years ago. There was a vast inland sea present. That was before our gold rush. That was before mass European migration. And that was before diking and transformation of wetlands that have greatly simplified what was an inland sea. So this was one of the earliest photographs taken in California. You can see seasonal floodwaters reaching out across the floodplain, valley oak trees, willows, standing tules. It's a very different place today. It's highly simplified. It's highly channelized. Um, it's affected not just by the transformation of that habitat, but also the flows. So on the left-hand side, that blue area represents what would have been affected tidally, so this is freshwater system, occasionally brackish, but at sea level, so it's pushing water back and forth and creating very complex environments, in part because of those flows, remember flows are fundamental, but also the hydrologic connectivity, the longitudinal connectivity from the tops of our mountains, the lateral connectivity across the floodplains, as well as the vertical connectivity to our aquifers. That's changed dramatically. So where the confluence of these two rivers, the Sacramento in the north and the San Joaquin in the south, used to come together and flow out into San Francisco Bay, is very little of that water flows out today. In fact, much of the San Joaquin is diverted entirely before it reaches the San Joaquin. What little of it does flow out is sucked back in through two giant pipes that stick it into two aqueducts that send it further south. So we're talking about 10 million hectares of irrigated land from that water. We're talking about 20 million people in the city of Los Angeles that receives that water. Much of the flow from the Sacramento River, in fact, is diverted through a maze of aqueducts and channels, all supported by levees, 
creating a maze that any salmon might get lost in. Certainly, I get lost out there when I'm in a boat. It's difficult to tell which way is which. But there's a fundamental problem with this, not just in the change in flows, not just with the change in habitat, but because we expose those soils to air as we converted them for agriculture, microbial oxidation began to break down these peat soils and we're undergoing subsidence at a scale that is difficult to fathom where some of these inland islands, you might refer to them as polders, are more than five meters below sea level. There's a two in three chance that either an earthquake or a flood or the combination of the two will destabilize the levees such that they will collapse and sufficient accommodation space is there that waters will rush in from San Francisco Bay and from the Pacific Ocean. This is brackish water, this is salt water, that then will imperil those 10 million acres or hectares of farmland, the 20 million people that live in Los Angeles. It'll take $50 billion to repair. It may take several years. It is the weakest link in one of the most engineered systems in the entire world. You add a meter of sea level rise due to climate change, it is the most vulnerable place in one of our most productive economies. So what are we going to do about it? Well, the current plan is to build a 50 kilometer tunnel, several hundred meters below the surface from north to south and bypass the entire thing. That might solve one problem, that's water reliability, but it doesn't solve the other problem, which is how to support our ecosystems. And that remains a big question, and, and that is the focus of the rest of this talk. In part, because there is a way forward, and it's one that has taken us a while to recognize, but we're at a point now where I believe there's been a convergence in thinking. And it all happened here at the Kasumnis River, which is the only undammed river on the west slope of the Sierra Nevada. I want to point out three things quite quickly on this antique map. One is the blue area, the sink of the Kasumnis. These are standing water. So when Europeans arrived to map this area, there was standing perennial water. That's important. Secondly, the distributary channel that's in the upper right-hand portion of that shows that these floodwaters used to spread out through anastomosing channels, that there were revulsions, that it was a highly dynamic geomorphic space. And then lastly, in small lettering at the very top, it says Old Indian Rancheria. Now, without going into too much detail about that, it's important to recognize that the native peoples of these lands were subjugated by the Spanish several hundred years prior to this happening. Um, but in this place, it was a very rich place, not just with salmon, but also tule elk, a number of other species that provided them with a place to be on the land. That is no longer, but I think it's important to recognize and contextualize what this place was like. Just because it's not dammed doesn't mean that it's not impaired. In fact, it's highly channelized, and it has built up levees. And in effect, it became the story of the Akali duckling, which you may remember was the, the little duck that was always left behind. In this case, it wasn't dammed because it didn't have high yield. There wasn't much snowpack. There wasn't much runoff. There weren't many good places to build a dam, so why go to such great expense to do that if you had all these other resources? It got left behind. But because it got left behind, there's remnant forest, remnant riparian forest, valley oaks, that are now preserved as part of a 20,000-hectare nature preserve in part from federal lands, in part from state lands, in part from regional park lands, local community lands, the Nature Conservancy conservation easements. It's the last vestige of native forest that we have left in California. Why? Because it floods. Because there is no dam control, it floods regularly. And because of that, there's no house building. And without house building, we have a little bit of compatible agriculture, and a whole lot of nature. It's a destination for sandhill cranes. It's a destination for Swainson's hawks. It's one of the last few places left in California where we can study rivers 
as they're supposed to behave in nature. That brings me to that moment where things really changed. In 1985, the farmer with his tomato field, there was a levee break. He was unable to come in and fix it. But what reserve managers recognized is that there was a cottonwood forest that sprang up from those floodwaters and those sediments. And they had spent lots of time and money trying to promote riparian forests as part of restoration schemes. And here, with very little effort, in fact, there was a riparian forest. And then they got to thinking, well, what if we were to breach other levees? What would happen then? So in 1995, a backhoe and a six pack started punching holes in levees. This is the result of that. You can see the accidental forest, which was from that accidental breach. And then you can see this intentional breach here with its crevassed sand splay and its lateral sandbar. Now, that based on first principles, we know that these avulsive river systems migrate back and forth. They build natural levees on their sides, and occasionally those break out to create these crevasse plays, which are places for deposition, for hydrochorus dispersal. These are the seeds and propagules of our native forest, and that those can take root. And in fact, if you project a little bit forward here, you can see the crevasse play designated as intentional forest adjacent to the accidental forest, and then forward to today, you can see that there's a very complex forest that's growing very rapidly, and the other intentional forest that we've created in the process. Just a backhoe and a six pack. We also know based on first principles that these are complex food webs, aquatic food webs on these floodplains, where we have detrital matter being broken down, we have primary productivity from phytoplankton, secondary productivity from zooplankton, a number of different fishes feeding on that but it isn't a static environment. In fact, it's highly dynamic. These processes vary over space and time. But based on those first principles, we know that floodwaters are the engine. They prime the productivity pump that then cascades throughout the rest of the ecosystem, and in fact, led us to this one discovery that fundamentally changed how we think about floodplains. If we were to do one of those clicker polls here, I'd say which one? Is the floodplain set of fishes, and which one is the riverine fishes? Well, the floodplain fatties are on your right. So these are genetically identical fish, just raised in two totally different environments. There's not only higher survivorship, there's more of those on the right, but clearly they're much bigger. And what we do know about salmon is that the bigger they are at the point that they outmigrate to the ocean, the greater the likelihood that they're going to survive outmigration, the greater the likelihood they're going to survive oceanic conditions, and the greater the likelihood that they're going to come back to reproduce. It's a virtuous cycle, and floodplains are the incubator. It's not without some trepidation, however. The Sacramento San Joaquin Delta is one of the most invaded estuaries in the world. This Asiatic carp is nearly 60 centimeters long. It's a massive fish. But one of the things that we learned is that, in fact, the, the waters that come off of these floodplains are beneficial for native fishes. At the point of disconnection, the only fishes left are the non-natives. All the natives have escaped. This is good news as we go forward, because we had this vision Then, if we could do this here, we could do this elsewhere, perhaps upstream. Why? Because this is the very same river without any water, so it goes dry each summer, in part because of that disconnection from the vertical connectivity. The aquifer is now so disconnected that we need to figure out a way to spread those floodwaters out, recharge our aquifer, have perennial standing water. If I told you these two dudes were from the Nature Conservancy, you might say, yeah, we're all right. But in fact, they are. So big tractors working with the Nature Conservancy, we set out to remove several levees, buttress another, another levee is what we would call a, a levee setback. Of course, this started in 2011. Two years of permitting later, we finally had some big equipment out there. And then we started what turned out to be a five-year flood study during a five-year drought. <clears throat> but that's how science goes. 
But in principle, we knew that these smaller floods, these are 107 years of uh, continuous daily data that were analyzed to show that there were frequency of different types of floods that happen at different times of year with different magnitudes. Again, all going back to the natural flow regime, something we can only study in this particular river to suggest that despite having seen very few of the large floods in the last 10 years, that it was inevitable that they were going to happen. And in fact, this past year, that did happen. We're at the top of this chart now, the wettest year on record after one of the driest and warmest five years on record, extremes and variability that are happening. So the day before I left, we went out and shot some new footage. That's a giant crevasse play in front of us. Those are sand deposits. That's a distributary network that's formed. Ahead of us through the small opening, two meters high of sediment deposits, big debris piles the size of houses, new channels forming, and undoubtedly new habitat for all sorts of critters. This brings me to the final points, which is this idea of the black swan. So prior to European naturalists coming to the southern hemisphere, they thought all swans were white. It wasn't until they came here that they realized that there could be a black swan. And that was a breakthrough watershed moment for them. It upended taxonomy and natural history. And now, whether it's financial markets or engineering, we see that an unforeseen event, although completely predictable in retrospect and one with um, extreme consequences, is a black swan event. So these levee failures might be a black swan event, but in reality, within the science, it's the convergence of ideas where it isn't just habitat restoration, here showing the 20 years of literature on habitat restoration in large rivers, and it's not just the flows, the environmental flows, 20 years of literature, it's that they're all beginning to converge on a single idea, and that is that both of these things matter. It's the integration of habitat restoration, allowing floodplains to flood, and being able to manage those floodwaters in such a way that we can begin to mimic natural processes. That is the black swan event. And that's what's guiding water management in California as we go forward, is we start to put in setback levees that have multiple benefits. We're talking about groundwater recharge. We're talking about creating diverse habitats that support all species, creating opportunities for native species to thrive. And some of those are in natural systems, some are in agricultural systems, but fundamentally we move towards a functional flows approach where we're trying to map the releases below reservoirs to match the life history requirements of the species of concern. It's the combination of those two things that as we go forward and scale up, here the Yolo Bypass adjacent to the city of Sacramento on a vast scale, so no longer the 200 hectare experimental floodplain, but doing this over thousands of hectares. The science clearly shows that floodplains are more productive, and that translates into more and bigger fish, and ultimately one that can be compatible with agriculture. Here, changing slightly the water diversion scheme for rice fields, the Nigiri project is putting fish on rice. We're showing how it can be done. We need to advance our science, and we need to do it quickly. So it's no longer what's going to happen, but what, we're, what are we going to do? In closing, I'd like to thank Dwayne, I'd like to thank the conference, I'd like to thank all of you, and hopefully some of what I've had to say today is of some utility to you. There's a whole lot more to this story that I haven't been able to share, but I'm happy to speak with you afterwards. Thank you.